1962, a picture was taken of the great Little Richard with a relatively unknown group at the time known as the Beatles. This encounter has been heralded for decades as the moment a rock and roll legend co-signed the coming British invasion. So he offered me half of the Beatles, and I, I, I never thought they was going no place, and so I didn't take it. I mean, they got this hollow, woo, woo, you know, they would say, woo, woo, and then... But this photo does not tell the entire story of what happened that night. Also in attendance were the Chants, a black five-piece vocal harmony group from the Caribbean neighborhood of Toxteth, who were known for mixing doo-wop harmonies with an electric backing band, as well as their signature matching suits and haircuts. In 1957, future Chance member Eddie Amu went to see Frankie Lyman and the Teenagers at the Liverpool Empire, and was one of, quote, very few black people in the audience. So, let's just make this clear. Someone behind the camera at this event asked the Chance to step out of the shot for another nearly identical photo. In the 2015 documentary, Get Back, The City That Rocked the World, Joe Ankra of The Chance recounts the night from his perspective. Paul said, um, look, come down to Cavern on Wednesday. We'll have a listen to you if you want to bring your group down. Five black guys all of a sudden appeared and at the cavern. You know? <laughs> Bob Waller runs up and says, I've just been on the phone to Brian. Brian cannot come over, but don't speak to anybody and don't sign any papers with anybody and he'll see you tonight. And John says, well, might as well do some numbers with us as well, you know. Eddie confirms the story, adding that the Beatles backed them about six times, but the relationship was ended by their new manager, Brian Epstein. Shortly after these performances, Epstein restructured his deal with the Beatles to take a larger cut for himself. Today, he is credited as the person who convinced the Fab Four to wear suits. He would not end up signing the chance, but did go on to work with Jerry and the Pacemakers, Billy J. Kramer and the Dakotas, The Foremost, The Circle, Tommy Quickly, Sounds Incorporated, The Moody Blues, and Scylla Black, a woman known in 2023 for two things, the surprise surprise meme and her George Martin produced copy of Dionne Warwick's hit single, Anyone Who Had a Heart, stating it needed that common touch or the commercial touch. Are we starting to notice the pattern here? A couple of weeks ago, I put out a video called The Beatles, Appropriation or Appreciation, featuring Eric Clapton, David Bowie, and The Clash, and was thoroughly prepared to never listen to or talk about this basic-ass band ever again. If you aren't a Boomer Stan, please go watch it and leave a comment. If you are a Boomer Stan, you should know that you share a personality with millions of other people. Anyway, in that video, I made the claim that a number of black American artists were not as popular across the pond, and included Little Richard on that list. This was clearly incorrect, as Little Richard was arguably more popular in the UK than he was in the US. I don't know what I was thinking. However, this does not refute the fact that industry professionals like Brian Epstein and George Martin were actively appropriating black American fashion and music to cater to racist white audiences, and were doing so with an objectively less talented pool of musicians. In 2010, Little Richard penned his own blurb for Rolling Stone's 100 Greatest Artists list. While appreciating being considered one of the best, he makes sure to add, who is number one and who is number two doesn't matter to me anymore because it won't be who I think it should be. The Beatles started with me, but they'll always be in front of me. He goes on to describe his early years, including the luxurious Cadillac he was forced to sleep and eat in on tour as he was not allowed in most hotels and restaurants. He wore, quote, pancake makeup and claims that his black peers did the same, performing what was often referred to as African voodoo music with white spectators relegated to the balcony. He says, I was the first black artist whose records the white kids were starting to buy, and the parents were really bitter about me. All right, so can somebody tell me why after dealing with all of that bullshit, Ringo Starr has a greater net worth than Little Richard, Ray Charles, Smokey Robinson, Aretha Franklin, Otis Redding, Chuck Berry, B.B. King, 
Lou Rawls, Muddy Waters, Screamin' Jay Hawkins, Buddy Guy, Albert King, and Billy Preston combined. Not only that, if we add Stevie Wonder's 200 million and Michael Jackson's 500 million, they are all less than Paul McCartney's net worth of $1.2 billion. There is a system in place that puts the Beatles above objectively more talented and influential black artists. That system is called racism. In the early 1970s, jazz great Charles Mingus mirrored these exact same sentiments. This is not some modern Gen Z trend. Black people have always been having this conversation. We will not dismantle racism by simply treating people of color with respect on the rare occasions that we encounter them, but by integrating the thoughts and experiences of non-white people into our daily worldview. I didn't consider that the Beatles were overrated until I listened to black people who were critical of them, just like I didn't know about the chants until this TikTok user informed me about them. The Beatles were the first real boy band. There were many heartthrob boys making black music before then, but they were the very first to be developed by label executives with the expressed intent to be international celebrities. The Chance would release a handful of singles and break up in 1965. We will never know what groups like these were truly capable of, simply because white people in positions of power did not consider them to be marketable. Good night and good luck.